I invite you to open your copy of God's Word, trusting you have it with you, again to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you, you can find one under a chair in front of you or one nearby, a black hardback Bible. You should be able to find Luke chapter 2 uh, on page 804, I think, of those copies of the Bible uh, that are there under, under the chair. Luke chapter 2, uh, this morning will be in verses 8 through 21. If you followed along with our Christmas Eve devotion, uh, either that you took home or that you watched online uh, yesterday or in uh, a few days past, Uh, You'll see that we already uh, spent time in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, in that devotion time, looking at the birth of Jesus. Today, we're going to look at good news of great joy as an angel from heaven announces the birth of Christ to some shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night nearby. Uh, I have to tell you that Christmas morning in a house with four kids, all 12 years or younger, gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, can't hardly wait. (laughs) The anticipation for this day to come, a day that's been sitting on the calendar for weeks and weeks, inching closer and closer as weeks go by and days go by and Advent calendar candies are eaten. And uh, actually, we don't do Advent calendar candy in our house. We do Advent hot chocolate. Uh, My sister and her husband started that uh, tradition for us. And so they give to our kids 25 days of toppings to put on hot chocolate. And so we have, a, we have sort of now a ritual. We make hot chocolate every day in December. Friends, it's too much hot chocolate, but the kids love it. But every day we're drinking hot chocolate out of little glasses, not big ones, because we're not crazy and they have to go to bed eventually. We're looking forward, they're looking forward to Christmas. And they see the last day on the hot chocolate sprinkle calendar, and Christmas Day is caramel on hot chocolate, I think. Is that right, kids? Yep. Yeah, see, they know. (laughs) But with every day that comes uh, and goes in December, the the hope, the, the longing, the anticipation for Christmas Day to come just seems to build and build and build with such intensity that at 3.30 a.m. on December 25th, waiting is impossible. I kid you not, 3.30 a.m. today, one of our children, I won't tell you which one, Olivia, came into our room, pitch dark, Dad, what time is it? 3.30, go back to bed. Bless her heart. It's just too much. Christmas is here. I can't stay in bed. Their little bodies are just bursting with joy and excitement to get up and see what the day has brought The anticipation is over. It's time to revel in the glory of the day that has finally arrived. And friends, the day has come, and it is now time for us to revel in the glory of the day that has finally arrived, not because of all the wonderful presents under the tree. All Of course, course those, those represent a greater gift, the gift to us of Christ the Lord who is born. And today, as we look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 21, we're going to see the news of the Messiah's birth coming to shepherds and the discovery of the Messiah by those shepherds inspiring glorious worship in the lives of these few who were so privileged to see him first. The main idea from Luke 2, 8, 21 this morning is this, that the arrival of the Savior lifts humble hearts to worship. The arrival of the long-anticipated Savior lifts humble hearts to worship. My hope for us this morning is that we would show and leave here in the wonderful joy that Jesus the Christ was born for us. Would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 21. Follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, 
which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. This is God's word. You may be seated. The arrival of the long-anticipated Savior lifts humble hearts to worship. This text, as I see it, breaks down into to two parts, good news delivered and good news treasured. Let's look first at the good news delivered. Uh, following from the birth of Jesus recorded in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, which if you read Luke 2, 1 through 7, you'll find that the description of Jesus' birth is relatively ordinary. There's not a lot of details. There's not a lot of flash. There's not a lot of pizzazz to his birth. It kind of just happens. But following on that very humble description of the birth of the Messiah, with all the, the buildup to who Mary's son would be that we've been seeing in Luke's gospel all the way up to this point over the last month, the son of the Most High, the descendant of David the King, the Son of God, we might expect to find news of his birth coming to kings in palaces and emperors sitting on their thrones. But instead, we get the very opposite. Luke takes us to the first recipients of the news of Jesus' birth, not in palaces, not on thrones, but out on a grassy hillside outside of Bethlehem. Not to kings, not to emperors, but to shepherds. Now, we who are familiar with the Bible may initially think that shepherds are a good image. After all, David, the king, was a shepherd before he was king. David even sings of God in Psalm 23, Psalm 23 about the Lord being his shepherd. Later on, we know that Jesus calls himself the good shepherd in John chapter 10. Even today, it's not uncommon to see images of shepherds in art or photography in ways that make shepherds look noble and kind and brave and gentle. But the truth is that in that day, shepherds were not always viewed so well. Some scholars and historians note that shepherds were often considered ceremonially unclean by the Jews because of their occupation. This means that they wouldn't have been allowed to worship in the temple in Jerusalem unless they went through appropriate cleansing ceremonies first. And most people would not want to be near a shepherd because if you accidentally come into contact, physical contact with a shepherd, well, now you're unclean too because they're unclean. And now you got to go through all the ritualistic cleansing before you can go worship in the temple also. Moreover, in some places, shepherds had not a so good reputation. Some shepherds in some places had a reputation for being thieves. I don't know why, I don't know what they would have stolen, but they not, were not well looked upon. Now, whether or not this was always true, that shepherds were always despised or looked upon poorly, certainly this probably wasn't always true. Right? One bad apple can ruin the bunch. There are probably a lot of bad shepherds. There are probably some that were not so terrible either. But in any case, you can see why shepherds were regularly among the outcasts in society 2,000 years ago. And yet it's to these outcasts, smelly, blue-collar, raggedy outcasts, not kings, not emperors. It's to these that the glorious news of Jesus' birth is delivered. And boy, is the news ever glorious. An angel from heaven, no less. We don't know if it was Gabriel or Michael or some other unnamed angel, but an angel appears to these shepherds that night, a warrior of light who, who himself served in the very presence of the only holy and pure creator of all things, flashes into the presence of this raggedy band of sheep herders. And like every other place angels show up in the Bible, the shepherds do what everyone's supposed to do when an angel shows up. You fear for your life. <laughs> Angels are imposing holy presences. They serve in the very presence of God Himself. But these shepherds, being afraid of this angel, are commanded, like we see in so many other places where angels show up and people fear, they are commanded to also not be afraid. The angel isn't there to harm them. The angel is not there to bring news of God's judgment against them. Instead, the angel has appeared to bring good news of great joy. Now, the news that the angel delivers is relatively short. It's just a couple of sentences in our Bibles. 
But the, the news is detailed, specific. It's short, but specific. This good news of great joy tells us what has happened. A baby has been born. And the good news tells us where in the city of David, that is in Bethlehem, which is not far from where the shepherds are watching their flocks. This good specific news tells us also the identity of this child that has been born. Not just that a baby has been born in Bethlehem, but but what has occasioned this glorious good news, the identity. He is a savior, the angel says, a redeemer for God's people who are Israel, and he is Christ the Lord. That's his last phrase that gives us the title for Jesus, this baby that is born, Christ the Lord. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's his title. And Christ is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one. In the Old Testament, kings and other servants of God, other people that he uses are called uh, Mashiach or Messiah, the anointed one. And that idea of an anointed king, an anointed servant, an anointed deliverer comes to take on a a whole new meaning or not a new meaning, but a greater meaning in the, the minds and in the lives of the people of Israel as they anticipate one anointed one who is going to come who's going to be the king that is better than all the kings that have come before, to be the servant that's been better than all the servants that have come before, to be a real redeemer, a deliverer for all time from sin. Christ the Lord, Messiah the Lord, is the one who has been born in Bethlehem. The anticipation of this deliverer who would rescue the Jews from their enemies and their oppressors was growing ever since the death of David and the divided kingdom of Israel. Jesus, the Christ for whom the people had long awaited, We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 26, that it was revealed to Simeon, who is a a, a prophet serving in the temple. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. In Luke 9, verse 19, Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ of God, the one we've been waiting for. In Acts chapter 2, After Jesus has been crucified for sins, raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, and Peter, that loudmouth among all of the disciples, preaches the first Christian sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he tells, he ends his sermon telling the people exactly who this Jesus is. He says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, this Jesus, both Lord and Christ, whom you crucified. He's the one we've been waiting for. So here's why the good news is so good. In just a short announcement, I bring you good news of great joy. It'll be for all the people. A child is born today in the city of David, who is Christ, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This short announcement in it, the angel is plainly saying to these shepherds, these outcasts of society, that God has kept his centuries-old promise to bring you a rescuer. And not just any rescuer, but a divine one. The Lord himself is your Christ. He is your Messiah. He is your Savior. And oh, by the way, smelly shepherds, he's just down the hill in a stable, swallowed up and sleeping in a feeding trough. He won't be hard to find at all. So go find him. And no sooner does the angel finish his announcement than he is joined with an army of angels, all singing in incomprehensible heavenly melodies harmonies, a song of worship to this God who has sent his Christ. Their song is simple. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's look at the content of their song. First of all, glory, glory. It's a word that means praise, fame, honor, worship, beauty reflected back to the source of all beauty, glory to who? To God and not to any other. To the only God who's the creator of all things. Glory to God in the highest, which is to say in the highest heaven, in the place where God dwells in inapproachable light. Glory to him who is holy and pure and perfect and righteous and who has also looked on us, his people. The angels sing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Why? Why peace on earth? Because the Savior is coming. A Savior is coming to put things right. A savior, a redeemer, a a rescuer is coming to make sinners right with God, to make them at peace with God. That's why there's peace on earth. And to whom? Peace on earth to all of those with whom God is pleased. How is God pleased with us? 
How is there peace to those who, who, how do we receive God's favor this way and receive his peace? Well, we receive it, scripture tells us over and over because those that God is pleased with are those that have been prayerfully and patiently waiting and hoping and trusting God for this day. There is peace with God for those today who, who look to Christ as the fulfillment of God's wonderful promise to send a redeemer. Church, I hope that you hear the good news this Christmas day, that Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior and Christ, was born. And not, that, not as some mythic or legendary figure, not, not as uh, 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 someone to, to, who lives only in the imagination of those that have made up this story, but that Christ was born in real life and in real history. But here also the good news that Jesus, human as he is, is also not like us. His birth served a purpose in God's plan to show God to us in perfect truth and clarity and then to save us from sin. The Son of God took on humanity, adding it to His divinity to be God with us, but not to just be like all of us, to be completely different and to show us something that we could never see apart from His birth, that is to see God clearly. The author of Hebrews, a book later in the New Testament, uh, it's kind of a letter, kind of a sermon, maybe a little bit of both. The author of Hebrews begins his sermon-like letter this way. He says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed to be the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, His Son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And after making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Why was Jesus born a baby in Bethlehem? To show us the wonderful glory of God to show us what the Father looks like, to reveal the Father's heart, His character, His thoughts, His desire, His will, His passion to save us, to reveal it in flesh and blood. Amen. This baby, lying in a manger, who would grow into a man, who would live a life without sin, was born to save you from sin by taking in Himself every bit of the just penalty for our rebellion against God. Jesus took on flesh to be born a baby that he might die for our sins. To borrow from Pastor Timothy Keller, the good news of Christmas, the good news of the gospel itself says that we are so much worse in our sin than we ever could imagine that we are, that we desperately need a Savior to rescue us. And at the same time, the gospel tells us that we are so loved by God as those that he has made in his image that he gives himself to be that one to rescue us. He gives himself in the person of his son, Jesus, to be the only perfect savior for us. Glory to God in the highest indeed, because he has made peace between himself and sinners for everyone who has received his son, the Christ. Friend, if you're here this morning and, and you maybe wouldn't consider yourself yet a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, and you've wondered why we get so excited about this baby born at Christmas time, it's not because we love babies, although I do love babies. We went to a Christmas party Thursday night with some friends of ours, and one of them has a new five-month-old baby girl, and it was my joy and delight to hold that baby for as long as her mama would let me. But that's not why we're excited about Christmas, not because we just love babies, but because we know who this baby, Jesus, the Lord, our Christ, who he grew to be and what he lived his life for and why he died and that he was raised again. Christmas is not just about Jesus being born. It's also about Jesus living a sinless life and dying in our place and being raised from the dead. It's almost impossible for us to talk about Christmas, to, to worship at Christmas without looking forward to Easter. And yet that's all the hope that is bound up in Christ's life. Friend, if you don't know this Jesus yet today, I hope you see in us as followers of Jesus joy in him, not because we love babies, but because we worship a risen, victorious Savior. Yeah. In Luke chapter 2, good news is delivered by glorious angels to humble, stinky, smelly shepherds. And at the receipt of this news, we find that same good news, once delivered, is now also treasured. It's treasured. 
Now this is the third angelic visitation already in the early chapters of Luke's gospel. We've uh, seen visitations by an angel already to Zechariah and another one to Mary. And in Matthew's gospel, we see an angelic vision in a dream to Jesus' adoptive father, Joseph. There was a question that was asked in each of these angelic visitations to Zechariah and to Mary. Zechariah asks a question of doubt. What will be a sign for me to know that you'll give my wife and I in our old age a son. And there's a question by Mary to uh, to the angel as well. How will this be? How can I become pregnant with God's own son if I'm not even married yet and my relationship to my soon-to-be husband has not yet been consummated? What? How? how? It's interesting that in all these other angelic visitations, we have these questions back to the angels, and we almost expect the shepherds to ask a question too, because that's how this goes, right? The angel shows up, he says, don't be afraid, he gives a word of news, a question gets asked, and then the angel answers it somehow. Well, not here. These shepherds have, in the announcement by the angels, all of the information that is necessary for them to do what seems the most logical, and that is to go find this child. I find it quite interesting, and, and just, it's just interesting to note. I don't know if there's a whole lot of significance to it, but it's just interesting to note that these shepherds, of all the people in Luke's gospel already, don't question what the angels have said, but immediately just go do what they've commanded them. Of course, the angels don't have to search the whole town of Bethlehem. Uh, excuse me, the shep- did I say the angels don't have to search? The angels know where Jesus is. The shepherds don't have to search. Uh, the whole town of Bethlehem because the angels have told them where to find Jesus in a stable, uh, in a manger, lying in a feeding trough, wrapped in swaddling cloths. So all the shepherds have to do is look for the stables outside of Bethlehem. And it being night, they only really need to look for the stables that have a lamp burning inside or a fire going nearby. It really seems as though that God has made this search process as simple as possible for these shepherds. Why? Not because they're stupid. I think, but because God in his joy over sending his son is saying, get to see him quickly. I'll tell you exactly where he is. And so, of course, in due time, those shepherds find the Christ child with his parents just as they were told. And what is their response? When they see this baby lying in a manger to two humble parents out in the cold of the night, what is their response? They delight. They rejoice. They worship in this good news proven true in front of their eyes. It seems that the shepherds themselves go back to the hillside uh, from that stable, grabbing and telling everyone that they see in the streets about what has happened, about what the angels said and what they saw and how wonderful it all is. Telling everybody about the angels and then all of the angels and the song that they sang and that baby in that feeding trough and it's just all too wonderful for them. I can see these shepherds just yelling and screaming and laughing in the middle of the streets. I can see Bethlehemites awakened in the night by their laughing and rejoicing that they poke their heads out of the windows to tell them to shut up only to be invited by the shepherds to make some noise to rejoice with them. These shepherds, like so many other Jews, had known the promises of a Redeemer who would come. And now they've seen Him with their own eyes. Fragile, humble, a baby, but all the same they've seen Him. And nothing is going to stop this raggedy band of shepherds from singing God's praises and shouting the good news that the Messiah has come. Friends, it's just too good not to share. But these shepherds are not the only ones delighting in the good news. Yeah, they, they do treasure this news, and, and they, they treasure the fulfillment of what God had said to them. It's, it is wonderful, and they go rejoicing, but they're not the only ones to treasure what's going on here. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is also highlighted by Luke in these verses. I wonder if you noticed it. Her reaction is quite different than the shepherd's. She's not out in the streets rejoicing, yelling and screaming. I mean, of course, she just gave birth to a child. But rather, she is quietly treasuring every little detail of what is happening. Luke says, I have to turn my page. Luke says, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. The way that Luke describes Mary, she is quite literally doing her best to force time to slow down so that she can remember how many shepherds were there? Just where she was sitting, where she was lying when they showed up in that manger. 
every word that they said. Remembering Joseph's protective reaction when these strange men came poking their heads into this stable. And then the softening of his stance when they told him about the angels and the song and the grunts of her newborn son as he fights against the swaddle maybe. And the angel Gabriel who spoke to her so many months before and all that he said about Jesus, that he was God's son. And the fact that now he's here. He's really, really here and he's hers and yet he's so, so much more. She is also his in some way. Not only is Mary treasuring all of these things, slowing time down to take in every detail that she might not ever forget it, but Luke says she's also pondering them, asking over and again the questions to herself, what does this all mean? Can all this really be? And at the same time, assuring herself, God is doing something truly amazing in my sight. He has wrapped me up in his plan to rescue us. And what business have I in all of this? This God that I serve is certainly beyond compare. Mary, in a way far different from the shepherds, is also treasuring this good news and all that it means. Friend, when you get good news, like really good news, like the news of your first child being born, or or maybe even better, your first grandchild being born, Or the confirmation, Pastor Denny, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, bring on those grandbabies, yeah. Or the confirmation from your doctor that it wasn't cancer after all. Or that the cancer is finally gone. Or the good news that the job you just interviewed, that you got the job you just interviewed for. Or good news that grandma is coming to town. When you get really good news, what do you do? My guess is that you might do like the shepherds. You shout and holler and rejoice and cry happy tears and laugh and thank God and sing and pump your fists in the air. Good news like this deserves to be treasured like this, rejoiced in like this, shared with others like the shepherds do. Have you come to know Jesus the Savior? Christ the Lord, not only as the baby born at Christmas, but especially as the Redeemer who took your sin on the cross and rose again to make you at peace with God Have you trusted Him? Have you known the full joy of Christmas because of the victory of Christ at Easter? If so, my friend, I invite you, treasure that good news of the gospel like these shepherds did. Shout your gladness to all who will hear it. Proclaim the same good news to everyone who will listen. Tell them, I have come to know Jesus, God's Son, and I have come to trust Him as Lord of my life, and my life will never be the same because of it. Remind the world this Christmas with songs and shouts of joy, oh, how God has loved us, that he would send himself to save us, to make us whole, to give us peace, to bring him to himself. What other God is like this? Many of us are going to spend the day today with family members eating meals and maybe watching Christmas movies and uh, opening gifts and all of that. Our kids are going to be yelling and screaming and making a mess with all the new toys and other stuff that they got. I'll have my new socks on. (laughs) There will be much rejoicing where we're going today, most likely. Friends, what would it be like? Parents, grandparents, what would it be like if our rejoicing in the Savior drowned out all the rejoicing over new toys by our children? That our kids might see their new t-ball set and say, I don't know what this is in comparison to this Jesus that my dad keeps talking about, but this is dull. Tell me about him. What if our rejoicing in Christ at Christmas so mirrored, so emulated, so reflected the joy of these shepherds at Christmas that we would shout and sing his praises to the point that everybody else is going, bro, you crazy. Can you just give it a rest? That we might respond, no, absolutely not. The news is just too good. Some of us treasure good news like these shepherds did. But maybe, though, when you get good news, maybe you don't do quite so much like the shepherds. Maybe you do more like Mary. Sometimes the good news seems so good. Sometimes the good news seems too good that you don't want to miss a single solitary detail of it. You want the moment that you receive the news to last forever, and so you think back on it quietly, pensively, You roll the memory over and again in your mind to think of all of the ways that good news was good then and all of the ways that that good news is still good today. 
and how the goodness of the first moment that you got the news is even better than it is now. Good news deserves to be, deserves to be treasured like this too. And the good news of the gospel, that Jesus has come to save sinners, is the kind of good news that gets better with every day. It gets richer with every passing moment, and yet somehow more beautiful and more wonderful the more that we think on it. Christian, have you treasured the good news of Christ this way? Does his birth, does his life, his death and resurrection, does it still warm your heart because you've treasured it, because you've pondered it? Do you find yourself sometimes struck silent because of the overwhelming goodness of God and love for mankind in the gospel? Have you come to realize, I will never get over how good this is? The fact that Jesus has come, the news of his arrival as a baby, as the introductory moment to everything that he does for us as Savior is good news for everyone who knows that they need a Savior like Jesus. And who needs a Savior like this? <laughs> not just these raggedy, smelly shepherds of Bethlehem, and not just the Judeans of 2,000 years ago, not just the generations of Israelites that had been waiting for a Savior to this point. But we all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we all need a Savior like this. All of us who know the sting of death and the brokenness in our lives that comes because of sin and rebellion against God, all of us who long for the kind of life that only God can give, all of us who know that we're not nearly as good as we'd like to believe and even far worse than many could imagine, everyone who is humble enough to see their need for God to step into our world and save it, is able to see the wonderful good news of Christmas, that He has done exactly that, that God has stepped into our world that He might save it. And whether you worship by singing and laughing and proclaiming that news in the streets or you worship today by stopping to consider all that this good news means for you and for your family and for your dearest friends who need to know it still, it is good news worth worshiping God for. This Christmas, here's my encouragement to you, my pastoral prescription. If you have known Christ as Lord, rejoice like these shepherds and tell somebody about Him today. Likewise, whether you've known Christ a long time or just a short while, take time to treasure the gospel deeply in your own heart today. Let it roll over in your heart and mind. Consider it from a different angle, a different perspective. Read through a gospel story uh, of Jesus' birth, maybe in Matthew's gospel, or maybe reread Luke's, or maybe read a slightly, uh, but the, and, and theologically, uh, uh, and, uh, the, uh, excuse me, say that differently. Read it in John's gospel, where he gives a whole different theological spin on Jesus' birth, but reflect on what it means that the word of life, Jesus, the Son of God, came into the world to make his home among us, to die for sins, to be raised again. Ponder it today. Treasure the gospel in your heart, even as you proclaim it to those who need to hear it. However you came in this morning, let us go out in wonderful joy today in knowing that Christ was born for us. Amen. Friend, if you're not yet a Christian and, and you came in here not believing, but you find yourself in the middle of this time of worship this morning, finding yourself maybe believing that this Jesus really is who the Bible says that he is, that, that maybe his life and his death for sins really does matter for you, and you've got questions about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to receive the gospel, what it means to be saved from sin through faith in Jesus Christ, I would love nothing more than to spend time with you this morning talking about and talking with you and showing you from God's word how you can have confidence that there is salvation in him, how you can leave this place with joy inexpressible because you've come to know Jesus, our Savior, Christ the Lord, this Christmas day. Whatever you need to do, however you need to respond in worship today, I pray that you will in obedience to God and with joy for what he has given to us in Christ. The arrival of the long-anticipated Savior lifts humble hearts to worship. His good news has been delivered. Let us treasure it also as we go this Christmas day. Let's pray together.